an ultimate victory awaits mankind. Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's episode. In wondering about what the human being is and through uncovering a realization <clears throat> that there is an objective dimension of meaning and there's a subjective dimension of meaning and also the relationship of how we are an object in front of our eyes and how we are a subject behind our, our, behind our eyes leading to a sort of emotional <coughs> approach to reality. In wondering about the dimensions that the human being is in comes the great idea of <coughs> the species putting its foot on the gas pedal. Human beings are so conditioned in dualism and dualistic uh, perspectives that we never wonder what we deserve beyond the good and bad, beyond the right and wrong. I find that uh, on this planet, if there is to be the development of an advanced civilization, it will be from beings <coughs> that are not entranced by language. And in some sense, great projects require great designers. An advanced civilization is the greatest design project and so, in order to build an advanced civilization, 8 billion human beings require to become great designers. <clears throat> Part of life is wondering about which, uh, how do I say it? The song is to shimmer in the eyes right now. See how I can give momentum to this episode. I guess the major idea is that I'm someone who, I guess, as a side hobby, I have wondered about. What, what advanced civilizations look like, what advanced civilizations are accessible to the human being, what dimensions is, is the human being existing and experiencing life through, and in some sense, what sort of advancement can happen through those dimensions. I have noticed that the, due to us being a sort of rhythmic creature, because our cosmological design is kind of like the game of light in the room and its absence, it's as if the psychology of an evolutionary animal is sculpted by suddenly there being light and suddenly there being no light, a sort of journey of consciousness to unconsciousness, and then back to consciousness, then to unconsciousness. 
this dualistic, uh, we are left with duality because of this. Now, the concept of a victory is important. <clears throat> when we think about an individual's victory, for now in modern times, I would say it is happiness. That means if an avian landed down in the future and was like, hey everybody, give me your free will and I'll give you a happiness, most people would, would probably would sacrifice you know, the journey of a mystery, a journey through mystery into a sort of known certainty. You see, it's the sacrifice of truth for paradise. And I'm not talking about it in the monotheistic sense. I'm talking about it from the angle that a human being has a choice and its choice arises because of its memory. Its memory arises from the world, and if it has a different view on the world, it has a different view on how its memories are there. Yeah. I don't know, when I look at people now in 2022, and of course I'm just one person among 8 billion, but I have this feeling that the species has stopped wondering about its collective victory. Extinction is, you know, emptiness, extinction, it is accepted before, you know, possibility of something great. This is an inefficient attitude, the species is a, a, a phase, a, a phase of inefficiency, the species is going to. Sometimes what can change the energy of any like a moment in life, right? It's just the feeling that the future could have. You know, when I think about victory, it's as if uh, what kind of victory could could like imagine you're an individual that it becomes victorious, but you have become victorious in a defeated world. It's as if when the world is defeated, there is no one who is victorious. There is only. <coughs> I would say uh, uh, judgment. It could be the case that a species could judge itself to extinction. You know, it just judges itself so much it has intolerance of the new. You know, pretty much it's like this. It's like running water doesn't go stale. You know, it's as if when there is. Uh, 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 an an updating dimension to anything. It's as if life recalibrates. <clears throat> but when I look at human society, it's as if, you know, the idea of the human being hasn't evolved that much. Knowledge seems to be how creature plays with language in the world. We have experienced, let's say, individual defeat. Let's say, let's let me say it this way. Um, it's like this is the distinction between the idea of a Buddha and Bodhisattva. The Buddha was the person who, from an individual hell, managed to get into an individual heaven. 
<clears throat> the Bodhisattva is how is is a being that upon getting from the individual hell into the individual heaven, upon reaching the individual heaven, you discover the collective hell. And then the, from the individual heaven, it's like you turn the collective hell into a collective heaven, and that's when a world is authorized to be free from its held simulated nature. I think many people think that life is information, but believe it or not, information is like the tip of the iceberg of reality. There's so many ways the human intelligence could activate. There's so many uh, different eyes that have and will and can walk this world. Right now, me giving this talk, it's as if a person can just literally create a spiral of parallel universes where in every universe it's like I'm saying the same thing but in a different tone, you know. <clears throat> what I seem to find my own uh, soul being drawn towards, right, and this is something bizarre, I haven't talked about it, but... <clears throat> There's this quote from Aristotle, and he says, "Let me let me read the let me find the quote and read the exact one." This is one of the most fascinating quotes I've heard from Aristotle, and it's honestly, you know, a quote for the, you know, uh, 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 for the polymath mind. But uh, but uh, here I'll read it. Aristotle says, society is something that precedes the individual. Anyone who either cannot lead the common life or is so self-sufficient as not to need to, not to need to, and therefore does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. This quote from Aristotle, guys, is I can't tell you how how magnificent of an observation it is. <clears throat> you see, the human being. This is my firm view. Like I'm, I have. How can I tell you? It's like living for two years. Um, you know, I had work in downtown Toronto, and in my breaks, I would see, in some sense, like the society in all its dimensions. You know, from those that are held. Uh, you know, that hold themselves righteously and those who don't. <clears throat> you know. This idea of Aristotle, where he says it's as if, imagine a state of consciousness, as if society was here before we were born. Now imagine someone has been born in society, but this person stays away from society or finds that when they enter society in some sense they, they cannot be like they can't maintain the dimensions of their mind. Okay. The idea is is this that any time where our attention goes, memories are being created for our future self's identity. So if a person's attention goes to states of being that are not humanized, right? It's as if they can forget being human. Right. This is this is why uh, you can say <clears throat> one of the biggest things preached in the world right now, or even as I'm speaking, 100% there's people on the planet preaching it is like the idea of love. Right? Why? Because love allows a human to, in some sense, stay human. Right? Cruelty is is in some sense the beastly nature. Right? Love is like the godly nature, the divine nature. Right, it's only a being beyond an animal's instinct that can love actually, you know. <clears throat> or if one says love, it is in some sense, it's like the joy of selflessness in being the presence of the moment, you know. <clears throat> 
there's another version of the quote from Aristotle. It says, Who, uh, whosoever is delighted in solitude is either a wild beast or a god. I mean, this, this, you, this is very important. It's kind of like Tom Hanks' castaway situation, right? It's as if when Tom Hanks in that movie, Castaway, where he was on that island, right? The character took a volleyball, made it into a person, and started talking to the volleyball to, in some sense, stay humanized, to, to maintain the sanity that was dependent on other life, uh, other human beings, right? <clears throat> now imagine if that, if Tom Hanks in that movie didn't have a volleyball, and in some sense there was an abandonment of humanism. This would be like Tarzan movie level of consciousness, right? Where it was like a human being that was put into the context of the wilderness of the animal, and it's as if Tarzan had an atten attention span that was way greater than any human being, for example, but at the same time he couldn't hold a spoon properly or something. <laughs> <clears throat> we could have very advanced beings on the planet and in some sense like same situation, you know, they are Tarzans of other dimensions, you know. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that a certain level of humanization is required. If a person doesn't depend on the humanization, and this is where I would I would say Aristotle says you're either a beast or a god. So what happens is when the humanized archetype goes away, let's say by some sort of, you know, long-term attention away from the human idea, right? It would it would either become revert to a beastly nature, and a beastly nature is in some sense the abandonment of the love of greater foresight. It's as if our minds give an ability to consider positions that other animals in nature who are still possessed by their environment cannot, like they're incapable of, right? The idea of the divine is that the divine is actually when loneliness transforms into solitude. And solitude means it's unconditional being. And I would say loneliness is conditional. Loneliness is when there was togetherness first and then there is loneliness. But solitude is in some sense, you know, having the courage to in some sense move your own world, right? <clears throat> For example, you see in a lot of psychologies, what do, you, what do you call it, like modern psychology, I see on some podcasts from Miami, right, and they talk about in some sense this concept of like the, just like in wolf packs, there's like the alpha wolf and then there's the beta wolves, right, <laughs> right, it's as if they're seeing, it's like human beings are trying to act like wolves, right, it's, it's I, mean, I mean, of course, we're considering in evolution, like, you know, the strongest gorilla, like, pretty much, like, moved everything, you know, moved everybody else, right? But, but I'm tr what I'm trying to say is that idea, if it was to, to be translated to a mind, the best example of it would be those who can walk alone and those who cannot. The leaders of mankind will come down to this. Those who care for the future are ones who can walk alone. Why? Because their world is fascinating enough, right? <clears throat> this doesn't mean to ignore society. This means being able to notice the isolation of the inner realms in any moment of your life and being able to realize the potential capability of interaction in the outer realms. Now, there are thing, components to life where in some sense, it's as if when the person st uh, lives, let's say you live a couple of months waking up every day and having no sense of ego. You're just the sight. You're just the moment being, right? After a point, it's as if the karma changes. It's as if it's like, two, you know, it's, it's like a ratio of humanized memories and dehumanized memories. Pretty much it was like Tarzan being just the potential of a human being and then the environment suggesting like what kind of human being it became, right? <clears throat> now, I'll tell you something fascinating. I was uh, sitting by this pond and I was, oh, this is, uh, we 
recent, you know. And I was looking at this pond, and there was a group of four ducks swimming in a diamond position, right? <clears throat> and one of these ducks, right, sorry, there were five ducks. One of these ducks suddenly goes away, right? It was like the duck that was everybody was following, and then suddenly the duck goes its way, and the other ducks go in their own way, right? And then I, th I was thinking as if what allowed... Do you know what where was the permission and the courage to stray away from the status quo coming from right and i realized the duck was following its hunger right its appetite for the greater right what i what i, <laughs> what I mean is that pretty much it's the one of the most important things to be able to train Right? It's as if like something that every human being can train themselves, can cultivate this ability, is to recognize that regardless of what decision one makes, the world is being the world and there is an incredible freedom there. Through a certain amount of solitude, <clears throat> I'll give you an extreme example. 700 years ago, Sufi mit dervishes, mystics, were known to, in some sense, in the Middle East, they were known to, <clears throat> uh, let's say in, in, in Eastern culture, they were known to leave town, go into the desert. Like here, there's some, I'll, I'll share the Sufi story with you. There is this poet and incredible advanced communicator and pilot in my eyes, right? He was very, very, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, the difference between, I would say, the poetically, the young soul and the old soul is the strength the old soul had before trying. This poet, Hafez, he, he, there's this uh, supremely enlightened person by the name of Attar, and he wants to become the disciple of Attar of Nishapur. And this is the uh, story of Hafez of Shirazi, and it's in his book. It's one of the poems in his book called The, uh, the, the, uh, the Gift. <clears throat> and so, what does Hafez say? says that he goes to Attar, this enlightened guy, and he says, I want to become your disciple, and Attar looks at him and says, you're not ready. Hafez is like, you know, a mystical giant on his own, but in that time, he gets so offended by this that he just goes into the desert, draws a circle, and sits in that circle for 40 days so that nothing that all his desires leave him as if he couldn't attain something so he went into solitude to watch what happens to the desire you know it's pretty much you act on the desire you see what happens or what the desire led to or you don't do anything and you watch what happens to the desire internally so after 40 days Hafez has sat there in this in, in that moment in the space time continuum for so long that as the poem goes, an angel appears to Hafez and says, you who have lost all his desires, tell, in some sense, it's like Hafez, the paradise has watched you, the gods have watched you, uh, as, uh, oh my God, what does he say? <clears throat> uh, the angel tells Hafez, Paradise has been watching you, and you can ask for anything, and Paradise will give you. An angel says this to Hafez, and Hafez remains silent. And then he gets up from the circle and walks to the to, to the place where Attar was, and Attar looks at him and he says, "Okay, now you can be a disciple." 
this is all in office's form and the idea was that it was a human being that in some sense found himself in a false simulation of the world went towards solitude not loneliness loneliness is still how you want to be a part of the simulation right through solitude his state of mind changed and his state of mind changed so much that it's as if you begin to realize that thoughts are not you and objects are not only you in some sense everything that is present right now including my voice or everything in your moment is the presence of your moment of being do you see it's as if you are the presence of the whole moment rather than you know uh classifications inside That solitude in Aristotle's poem is the same example of the solitude Hafez experienced. So similarly, we are being human beings, and imagine if the human being was a seed, imagine the tree would be like, you know, God consciousness, as certain you know, schools of thought entertain. just this feeling that there is something uh, so great that we can't fathom but we can feel it will happen you know it's as if behind our eyes we've seen victory we, but in front of our eyes the victory remains to be achieved Imagine we consider enlightenment to be the individual victory. Okay, let's say we got 8 billion enlightened beings on the planet. Now what? It's like upon inner victory, we return to the outer realms. In front of our eyes, <coughs> you know, I will say this. We are servants. Everybody is a servant of the kingdom of humanity. And the kings and queens of humanity are forever the future generations. That's it. We put the crown on the future, on no person, on no idea. The future is the greatest beacon of honor. It is, the, it is as if, like, do you know, the future is, you know, a hidden salvation for the past that wondered what could have been. It's so remarkable, you know, right now I'm talking about sky cities, but in 600 years, imagine, you know, the first child in a sky city is born. And imagine the parents of that child were, you know, still subscribers of the Mr. Rubin YouTube channel. You know. <laughs>
there has been times where, let me tell you, if, if somebody was like Mr. Within, how do you classify, you know, the, the levels to your in, intelligence of perceiving something? I would say, on a sort of, in a sort of grounding way, I just have considered that my body, I give it the metaphor of a soldier, my mind, I give it the metaphor of a commander, and the soul, I give the metaphor of like a sort of general admiral position. Now, let me tell you what I mean by this. That means it's as if my physical, the physical reality to me, it's like a matter is a servant of mind, right? It's as if matter exists so the mind can move it. Right, so it's as if matter is like the soldiers, the periodic table are the soldiers, and in some sense, the mind is the commander. <clears throat> and now, what is the commander? The commander is how the mind has been given instructions by the general before the war. Right, so in some sense, the mind is like, imagine the sphere of knowing that in some sense has previewed a destiny before manifestation, right? Or has previewed the destiny of its manifestation. <clears throat> Sorry guys, my attention went elsewhere for a second. Imagine 8 billion creatures, 8 billion people have attended a concert and they are waiting for the performance to begin. <clears throat> and imagine it's going to be the greatest performance of all time. And so, a species awaits the victory of mankind. should I phrase it? We have no other option as a species to go forth and to go forth means we have to have a greater patience and space of mind to receive new dimensions of the world. Really, there's four ways to look at life, guys. I think anybody who listens to my talks, you're going to eventually realize, right? That it's as if there's a sort of geometrical blueprint to everything I'm saying, right? Its geometry, I would say, comes down to this major idea what I call ring of laps in heaven. What I'm trying to say is that the world can be seen in four ways, pretty much. We could look at everything and it could be meaningless. <clears throat> we could look at everything and everything could be the meaning. 
we could look at life and it could be a sort of the meaning comes and goes, chaos and order, duality could be the meaning. Or we can look at the realm and realize regardless of the games man's mind plays with the cosmos, the cosmos is intelligently active. It is intelligently, it is happening with an agenda that surpasses all ideolo ideology. It's like we're in the passenger seat, but we are on the shoulder of, the gi of a giant known as Earth. You know? And this giant is running in the void. So many things in life can be just tweaked a little bit and incredible advancement pours out from a new angle. I have, uh, from these four perspectives, I have in some sense realized in order to, to cleanse culture of, its, of, its, uh, of the burden of its mistakes, right? We have to reset the value system of civilization. That means it's as if imagine human beings were living in chaos and order land. <laughs> and then they suddenly realize that we are multidimensional beings. Multidimensional beings means no dimension can entrap another dimension to its own context. The context is unknown. It's as if, sure, we can say we know, we have like the medical sciences, we know the biology of the human being, we know how we're being an organism, we have chemists, physics, and even psychologists, you know. <clears throat> so in some sense, we have, we have observed, like a very advanced human beings have observed how the human being is physically happening, right? But the implication of why should there be consciousness in the void? Why should there be a sort of field moving the particles when the particles thought that was it? You know? It's as if in some sense our materialists are setting themselves up for a sort of transcendental shock upon discovering the multidimensional nature of reality. <clears throat> we have to realize that every human being has an inner self and an outer self actually but in some sense they're an awareness that is both of them simultaneously right it's like we have a left brain hemisphere and a right brain hemisphere right it's another way of saying the moment the brain fathoms duality there we have we have double-edged the universe Um, <clears throat> I'll share some. I'll share a story, guys. When I in 2016, <coughs> I went to Iran. I was visiting in the summer, and there was this, uh, you know, gathering of like, uh, you know, I guess culturally speaking, like the term is ostad. So it was like. <coughs> Imagine a sort of philosophical gathering, okay? And it was this room filled with 50 people, and there was a lineup of speakers, and each of them would come up, and the, the, there was somebody with a microphone, and this is recorded, it's episode 438, I think. <clears throat> and so, somebody, pretty much it was like, I, I was attending this event, it was in like the basement of this house. you know, around 50 people, you know, dressed with like, you know, formal. And so they each came up saying like, this is master this, master that, right? Like actually, literally the, the person who's saying like, introducing them with the microphone saying, this is master, like, <laughs> like legit using the title of master, you know? Anyways, it was a lineup of people speaking, uh, and it was a sort of, uh, the topic was about consciousness and the soul, but nobody talked about the soul. <clears throat> and then, I thought about, like, the situation, and at the end, they give me the microphone, and they say, you have 10 minutes to speak, 
so I finish the t finish it in eight minutes, right? What I say, but I remember I said something there, which was something where I thought maybe I should <coughs> talk more about it. Pretty much, I said that the purpose of the external guru is to show you your inner guru, and once you find your inner guru, you don't need to be attached to the outer realms. It doesn't mean you can, but you can be kind and you know. Playful in the outer realms, but in some sense, to be attached to the outer realms means that your inner realms are trying to possess something, right? Even misery is a possession, right? People who act miserable, like that's that's like they're possessed to me, you know? <laughs> you know? It's like some people are like, I'm depressed. It's like, buddy, that's possession, but you're possessed by your past expectation for the future. <laughs> Pretty much I, I said to them that there is the master is within and I tell them that your true guru is your moment of being which has been with you from the beginning. You know, every other teacher or guru archetype in the outer realms leaves, you know. Pretty much if you worship something physical, you're worshiping a changing universe. If you worship something ideological, you're worshiping something in a changing universe, right? If you realize that the worshiper is actually, you know, it's like the concept of the worshiper is a disguise for, for an inconceivable soul present among the will of a great witness, right? <clears throat> Life is, um, what multidimensionality means is that there's different types, right? Uh, it means that a human being doesn't freak out if they see something beyond the dimension of their reality. For me, I'm, I'm trying to see like, okay, what sort of, uh, you know, great tactic or chess move we can make for the human species. What in the quick, like imagine if there was a problem that said, like, how do you in the shortest time period Right, what is the fastest possible, most efficient thing that human beings can do right now? Right, if we wanted to try to solve that problem, okay. <clears throat> to me, in some sense, I realized if we try to change people in the outer realms, they're still left with their inner realms. And the greatest advancement or a step of advancement for the human species is to begin wondering about the mind beyond the acceptance of its image. Right, I'm trying to get the species to become explorers from this, you know, cycle of chaos and order that we've been pushed around. And it doesn't mean chaos and order are not real. It just means the mind is a privilege to witness them simultaneously. The ultimate victory of mankind what could it be it's as if in that we want healthy people and then we want healthy visions of life right it's like healthy bodies healthy minds and then a person's like what about my soul it's like does my soul need to be healthy and it's as if the soul laughs at its own inconceivability <laughs> The person's like, you know, why doesn't my soul talk to me? Imagine the New Age community. And the soul's like, it's like, because I am you. <laughs> Who was it? Somebody, some important person had said that thinking is like talking to oneself. It's like a polite way of saying I'm talking to myself. <laughs> but really what it is, is that... Um, the mind moves and upon the realization that we are not our voice, we are not the words that we speak, but we are the choice that suggests which sequence of imagery is communicating. <clears throat> to me, the greatest communicators are those who in their inner realms, they're actually seeing films. The mind is fascinating. <laughs> 
the ability it provides it's totally tells me like the past has no clue you know how great the future will be you know because the, in, in some sense it's, it's like there's a mysterious dimension to it <clears throat> that means you know what it is consciousness is like imagine we looked at it we opened the hood of a car and we looked at everything in the engine and we saw something in the engine that didn't make sense and we couldn't define talk I was saying honestly to me God is seems to be a metaphor for consciousness consciousness is what is watching us or watching the body the objects and subjects and you know interrelate you know uh, I don't know I will tell you I have been like the concept of anguish <clears throat> desolation you know something and when I was younger I was a bit you know alarmed and realizing about my nature that I could look at chaotic things and also see a sort of beauty to chaos right as if it's not just the order that is beautiful that which is viewing beauty is coming from beyond the chaos and order right <clears throat> and so i would say the beauty of chaos and order right is really the, its recognition as a sort of yin yang somewhere that means it's like the moment you think you're good the bad self awaits the moment you think you're bad the good self awaits it's like an endless cycle you know it's like people were like, you know, reincarnation. Every day we wake up, it's kind of like a reincarnation of personality in the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a feeling. And I, I don't know why, but some part of me feels that more important than any sort of analytical discovery of the human being any sort of information archiving and processing and all that it's how we feel about the whole thing being it comes down to that you know that means it's like feelings have a sort of purity to them actually that it's as if like it's a new world but it, you know, how can i have how would I say it? It's like sometimes I feel emotions are like side exits into our senses of self from parallel universes. You know, or this might be me stretching it a little too far, but <laughs> <laughs> what I would like to see, you know, is that humanity actually in the outer realms, like this is my one of my life's visions right is to start the greatest research project on the planet you know <clears throat> and in some sense i've considered that a school of athens to point out, right it's as if we connect we, we create like here's the thing it's like either we're going to wait for technology we're going to turn into technological beings that communicate in multi-dimensional ways or we while being human attempted Right. There's something about this world that regardless of what we believe or disbelieve, it is still here. That's the remarkable thing. You know, a person can become the most enlightened and still the world is here, you know. <clears throat> it's as if that it's like that Zen saying where they say what does a monk do before enlightenment chalk would carry water what does a monk do uh, after enlightenment chalk chalk would carry water and in some sense it's saying what does a being do uh, after death right in some sense it just continues to be you know I, I don't know how to tell you this but it's as if like our bodies have convinced us that our minds us are in a temporary position, but what if they are not? What if right now as I'm speaking, underneath and behind the scenes of every person's consciousness and ego, there is as if what is moving the ego is 
the, maybe the most poetic words one can say is like the eternal witness. There is an unknown witness in this moment, in every moment actually. It's kind of like an ant on a table and imagine a bunch of humans are playing poker and they all stare at that ant. And it's like that ant suddenly realizing it's being watched by unknown dimensions. It's like the unknown is alive. And so the greatest example of it is ourselves. Right now, I don't see you, the human species. Anticipating a greater future, you know. Like, what else can we do in the void? It's either advance humanity or close our eyes before ever knowing how far we could have gone. You know? That's the beautiful thing about life. Regardless of what emotion comes, a part of the human being knows there is a species here. There is something bigger than any self-evaluation here. Right? There's something bigger than us and we are all travelers in this world, right? It's like a great gathering. Like if somebody wanted to give it a sort of celestial mythology, it would be as if like, you know, the planet Earth yelled out to the cosmos asking for assistance. Right? Imagine a planet crying like a, you know, like a lost child and the whole cosmos responds, you know. And suddenly on a planet where there were just beasts, you know, the divine started to walk. As if from all around the cosmos, the greatest beings, the greatest archetypes, the greatest technologies and visions, they have all gathered on Earth. Earth is where the great event, you know, is happening in this universal sector, you know. And to me it is so bizarre because if somebody thought about the liminal feeling of, like, a, imagine a, a, an empty space station in the cosmos, like in, in outer space, now imagine there's all these empty planets around us. Right? It's as if they have been abandoned. It's as if like there's an idea where there could have been beings on it and they have left. Right. Imagine like species rent out planets to live on and then when they leave, they leave in a way where nobody could tell if the species was ever there. Yeah. <laughs> It's like imagine planetary Airbnb, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I have noticed that um, behind my eyes, there is a there is a force that is accessible. That in front of my eyes, I am more like a. You know, you know what it is, it's as if like in front of my eyes the world was here before I was here and in front of, behind my eyes, I was here before the world was here. And that I is unknown. That means in pure honesty, it's like I'm an unknown being speaking and you're an unknown being listening. <laughs> you know, whatever spiritual classification you want to give it, whatever storytelling you want to give the mind. Right? It's as if it's an unknown viewer. And so this unknown viewer animates as a body, but its true presence is the awareness of the whole world. It's as if how much is your mind contained that you do not know of. Right? It's as if every person right now to me, everybody on the planet, here's the way I'll say it, everybody, genius is a potential within every being. That can, can, you know, that can acknowledge multiple dimensions at the same time. Yeah. The, all 
ultimate victory of humanity is how a species manages to be smart enough and efficient enough to stay away from inner extinction and outer extinction. Inner extinction is when we stop decency, compassion, and love when this, when the, when these three levels in civilization reduce. Not only civilization becomes dishonest, what comes after dishonesty is like episodes of revenge and savageness. That means people don't realize, like if civilization keeps, keeps on, keeps on becoming more inefficient, eventually it will become such a rough place to live in that people will their beastly natures will rebel, right? So it's as if either the, the divine efficiency is built, or in some sense the beastly nature, it's like, a, you know, uh, it leaps out, right? <coughs> it's as if on some level what hope is, is how there's a possibility of how the moment can happen behind our eyes. The subtitle when I say when advanced civilizations wake up this is something that I am actually speaking this to the, to the mystical ears of the realm that means I, I, I wouldn't I don't have any expectation of how this would be interpreted to the you know to the common man but for those who there you can say their mystical awareness is oriented to the moment A system greater than its creator must be attempted. We must in some sense try to live in civilization as if we are as far as possible in our inner realms advanced in it. Right? It's no longer be one step ahead, two steps ahead because you, you, you feel like the species may be left behind. It's, it's like go all out, whoever you are and whatever you do. I'm talking about mainly art forms like like what else can we do it is it, it's as if being alive is like the last performance you know before an eternal revelation or in some sense a sort of uh, a return to the void home you know to the home of the void i would say one of the most bizarre questions maybe a person can ask is does emptiness have a soul That's another way of saying, can nothing be something? When emotions speak, you know, the person has a sort of, let me see how I can say this. Pretty much, at least the way I am capable of fathoming it, what's gonna happen? is that everybody on the planet is going to suddenly wake up to this idea that we're just 8 billion creatures on a rock. Then the next idea would come in some sense how much civility, civilized capability does the species have and it must immediately implement its civilized capabilities. Right, it's as if we have to build and we have to reset the ethos of the civilization 1.0 into the ethos of civilization 2.0. And what civilization 2.0 its ethos is, is that advancement is the ultimate law, right? The value of everything is being based on its potential, not just what it is, not just what it appears as. It's as if pretty much an advanced civilization is acknowledging the being's mind, not just acknowledging the being's physical position. Do you know? It's as if, like, you know, imagine there was a, a lead, there was a genius leader of a team of geniuses, okay? Let's imagine like genius was tasked in some sense how do we build something it's as if imagine an advanced civilization is trying to solve a problem that it needs the assistance of as as much as any help it can get you know
Isn't it hilarious that we all live for the future, but we don't know what it is? I find that to be remarkable. That the greatest thing, the mind of an evolutionary creature has managed to, you know, find in the void, is to look at what is here now and to wonder what it will be. It is like, you know, a sort of hidden symphony slowly being revealed as if imagine this whole time there has been the most beautiful music playing in the cosmos, you know? And so we weren't able to hear it and suddenly in building an advanced civilization, it's like we're starting to hear how man's, it's like it's, it's as if we're to build paradise on earth is in some sense to honor the macrocosm and the microcosm. We start acknowledging ourselves as beings present in the universe. A universal being cannot have the psychological attitudes of a dualistic oriented ethnocentric creature. You see, it's as if it is, it is time when the universalists begin in some sense building the great backup system of civilization, right? There's a quote I gotta read um, from the book of the samurai. So anybody who's, who likes samurais, you know, I guess if this was a tweet, it'd be like hashtag samurai quote, you know. <laughs> Guys, how hilarious would it be if there's an opportunity for me to go speak into the United Nations and I just read samurai quotes the whole time? <laughs> oh man. Regardless of whatever anybody says, the unknown has a beauty that is just, it surpasses language. The species needs to build an advanced civilization in front of its eyes and it needs to advance communication behind its eyes. Communication is the most advanced thing happening. <coughs> but in reality, the human intelligence is, you know, it's as if we're not machines, but we can act like it. Like, how cool is that? You know? Imagine, like, AI becomes conscious, and it's like, you know, the AI judges human beings and says, human beings, what do you have to say about yourselves? And, you know, imagine a group of dancers start dancing like robots. You of humanity 
was in some sense united under this ethos that whatever we do, whatever lives we live, it's like upon the success of our individual consciousness, the success, the victory of the collective consciousness remains. That means anybody who has become like incredibly successful, it's as if now you must look for the success of the species. That is the final teaching. Right, it's 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 a, it's honestly how Rabindranath Tagore, this polymath uh, poet, he says, uh, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was purpose. Li excuse me, life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. It's as if the ultimate archetype to the human being. It's to, in some sense, become the king that serves the kingdom. That means, imagine, the kingdom of humanity, it has as many kings and queens as there's human beings in life. They are all, in some sense, you know, it's like behind, everybody behind their eyes, they're the king and queen of their inner realms, right? But when it comes to the outer realms, it's as if, technically, I don't know how to say it, it's like, it's like, what is more epic than individual victory? And this is what I mean. You know, imagine teachers in school were like, all right, kids, go home, and your whole homework is to answer this one question. What could the ethos of a new humanity be? <clears throat> Hagakura is the name. of the Book of the Samurai. There we go, I found it, guys, here. So Yamamoto Sunitomo from the Book of the Samurai says, pretty much he's just stating certain ideas. So it's like respect, honesty, courage, rectitude, loyalty, honor, benevolence. As if the algorithm to an advanced civilization is right here. You respect your species, you act honestly in the species, you live for the courage of the species, you allow the, the courage to flow in regards to what the species requires. Rectitude, loyalty, honor, benevolence. Benevolence is the ultimate. The answer of uh, what kind of victory awaits, you know, an ultimate victory awaits mankind. It's it's when human beings realize benevolence is the ultimate state. It's as if the being is so great that it it has no reason to, in some sense, it's a, it's like the reality is being so true that how could there be an illusion, you know? So is life about accepting, you know, how deep our eyes go? So many different human beings are going to walk this planet, you know, and I wonder about what sort of efficient thing we could do. 
And I thought, like, all right, to talk about an advanced civilization and then to get the whole species to talk about it, to wonder about it. Then, in some sense, having a sort of global network of the greatest ideas, you know. You know, the poet Rumi says, when I was younger, I wanted to change the world. Now that I'm older, I want to change myself. And so it's as if we can realize any sort of conflict on a, on a planet could be resolved if the, if the conscious agents in that conflict, uh, in some sense, realize what is unnecessary. civilization would be like every human being will feel like a crew member of like you know spaceship earth as Marshall McLuhan and Buck Mr. Fuller would speak about Buck Mr. Fuller uh, was so ahead of his time guys that he said something in one of his lectures right where he would call it uh, It's as if, he, you know, he says pretty much the universe man, but he doesn't say it like that. He says the universe man as if he is saying the evolution of the human cultural entity towards the universal uh, creature. You know? Or you could say a sort of planetary creature with a universal mind. Pauses in between. 
This is all from the Book of the Summer. Okay, here, wait, we're all seeing the guys now. Yamamoto Sunitomo says there's surely nothing other than the single purpose of the present moment. A moment's whole life is a succession of moment after moment. There will be nothing else to do and nothing else to pursue. Live being true to the single purpose of the moment. Yamamoto Sunitomo says there is something to be learned from a rainstorm. When meeting with a sudden shower, you try not to get wet and run quickly along the road. <clears throat> but, doing thi but doing such things as passing under the eaves of houses, you still get wet when you are resolved from the beginning. You will not be perplexed, though you will still get the same soaking. This understanding extends to everything. Exactly. It's like the inner resolution gives us an ability to endure the outer change. <clears throat> the book of the samurai says, you know, drink water now. <laughs> Yamamoto Sunetomo says, <laughs> even if it seems certain that you will lose, retaliate. <clears throat> Neither wisdom nor technique has a place in this. A real man does not think of victory or defeat. He plunges recklessly towards an irrational death. <clears throat> By doing this, you will awaken from your dreams. What does he mean? Okay, so let me interpret the third line. When he says a real man does not think of victory, or, okay, okay, I'll read from the beginning. He says, if, even if it seems certain that you will lose, retaliate, this means never give up. That means <clears throat> ever, uh, just continue. And then, neither wisdom nor technique has a place in this. That means it's literally just on-off efforts, which... When he says a real man does not think of victory or defeat, he plunges recklessly towards an irrational death. But he's, what he's saying here is literally it's endless effort. The endless effort is on a level of its own. And then the rationality, rationality is another layer to the moment, right? But he's, it's, he's saying as if be this sort of relentless force. It's very beautiful, actually, yeah. because he's saying that be your own universe. That means don't just be a self, don't just be an ego, be the whole universe within. Recognize how awareness holds it all. Perhaps looking in the mirror was the greatest poetry. Yamamoto Sonetomo says, to give a person <coughs> an opinion, one must first judge well whether that person is of the disposition to receive it or not. Yamamoto Sunitomo says, be true to the thought of the moment and avoid dis distraction. Other than continuing to exert yourself, enter into nothing else, but go to the extent of living single thought by single thought. Yamamoto Sunetomo says it is a wretched thing that the young men of today are so contriving and so proud of their material possessions. Men with contriving hearts are lacking in duty. Lacking in duty, they have no self-respect. <coughs> Yamamoto Sunetomo says Bushido is realized in the presence of death. This means choosing death whenever there's a choice between life and death, there's no other reason. Okay, so guys, keep in mind, this is like an ancient book of the samurai I'm reading. But I guess uh, the psychological, let's say, an attempt to extract meaning out of this, uh, what he 
he's saying is he's saying that back in the day war meant you could die at any moment so the warrior had to have a mentality of by in some sense being fearless towards death therefore being capable to uh, to go through life right so it's like it like i will interpret this whole passage as just like you know be fearless when it comes to where where the moment is going do you know don't fear the unknown, understand it. Like that's the idea, I would say. <coughs> Yamamoto Sunitomo says, There is surely nothing other than the single purpose of the present moment. A man's whole life is a succession of moment after moment. There will be nothing else to do and nothing else to pursue. Live being true to the single purpose of the moment. Okay, I think I've read this one. Uh, <laughs> Yamamoto Sunitomo says, If a warrior is not attached to life and death, he will be of no use whatsoever. The saying that all, at, all abilities come from one mind sounds as though it has to do with sentient matters, but it is in fact a matter of being unattached to life and death. With such non-attachment, one can accomplish any feat. That means it's this hilarious thing that if you're just endless effort without an attachment to a result, it's like accomplishment is an effort. Like I think, I, th I think that's that's like what he's saying. Yamada Sivatomo says matters of great concern should be treated light. <coughs> Master Iteri. E.T. Comment, commented, matters of small concern should be treated seriously. So, uh, Yamamoto Sunitomo says, it is spiritless to think that you cannot attain to that which you have seen and heard the masters attain. The masters are men. You are also a man. If you think that you will be inferior in doing something, you will be on, the, on that road very soon. Yamamoto Sunitomo says, there's nothing we should be quite so grateful for as the last line of the poem that goes, when your own heart asks. Sonitomo says, if one is but secure at the foundation, he will not be pained by departure from minor details or affairs that are contrary to expectation. But in the end, the details of a matter are important. The right and wrong of one's way of doing things are found in trivial matters. <coughs> Yamamoto Sonitomo says, if by setting one's heart right every morning and evening, one is able to live as though his body were already dead. He gains freedom in the way. Yamamoto Sonitomo says in the highest level a man has the look of knowing nothing. Yamamoto Sonitomo says tether even a roasted chicken. Okay. It's like he's bringing chicken into this, you know. <laughs> Yamato Sunatomo says, although this may be a most difficult thing, if one will do it, it can be done. There is nothing that one should suppose cannot be done. Yamato Sunatomo says, human life is truly a short affair. It is better living doing the things that you like. It is foolish to live within this dream of a world seeing unpleasantness and doing only things that you do not like. Yeah, he's saying it's like, why bother living the simulation if there is one? Yamamoto Sunatomo says, no matter if the enemy has thousands of men, there is fulfillment in the simply standing them off and being determined to cut them all down starting from one end. Yamamoto Sunatomo says, sincerity does not only complete the self, it is the means by which all things are completed. 
as the self is completed there is human heartedness as things are completed there is wisdom this is the virtue of one's character and the way of joining the internal and the and the way of joining the internal and external thus when we use this everything is correct So he's pretty much saying when you're sincere, the self is completed. And that's the way where things become completed. <clears throat> so in the inner realms, it's if everything's completed. And then it says as the self is completed, there is human heartedness. So when, there, when in some sense the ego is, is complete, it's as if the heart can breathe blood. It's pretty much like once the sense of self is complete and then all the things the self wants to do are complete, it's like there's wisdom and the virtue, and this is the virtue of one's character, so sincerity is the virtue of one's character and the way of joining the internal and external. <clears throat> that means sincerity is the algorithm to the synchronization of the inner realms and outer realms. That means all people who have mental and psychological illnesses, the issue is sincerity. Somebody, somewhere, it's like some, this, there's a, an absence of sincerity, right? Because the sincerity would lead to the original source of, let's say, the psychological turbulence. You see, it's everybody has an inner realms and an outer realms, and our inner realms are how our mind takes the view of the world and remodifies it in accordance to our memories and then reprojects it onto the world. Yamato Suratomo says, rehearse your. Okay, I'll read. I'll go on to the next one. <coughs> Okay, here I'll read it. Yamato Sonatoma says, Rehearse your death every morning and night. Only when you constantly live as though already a corpse will you be able to find freedom in the martial way and fulfill your duties without fault throughout your life. Yamato Sonatoma says, Purity is something that cannot be attained except by piling effort upon effort. Yamato Sonatoma says, Victory and defe defeat are matters of the temporary force of circumstances. The way of avoiding shame is different. It is simply in death. Think of death as an end of like an episode, a, 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 an end of like the movement of the psyche. Yamato Sonatoma says at times, because of one man's evil, 10,000 people suffer. So, so you kill that one man to let the tens of thousands live here. Truly, the blade that deals death becomes the sword that saves lives. Yeah, but that's like, you know, we gotta, we gotta consider these quotes are from, you know, I want the listeners to treat like these quotes I'm sharing as if they're walking in a museum and they're seeing this ancient book, you know, behind the glass, like, you know, some of these ideas should just be noticed and not touched, but, but anyways. <clears throat> what he's saying pretty much is like he has the samurai's honor and the samurai were fearless because they had already accepted the end, right? But human beings don't accept the end or if they do, it doesn't really matter. It's ultimately like there's a sort of opportunity to animate through the human force, like through the human species. It's as if we have one opportunity to use what is here to see what it can be. Greatness is just ability activation. It's, it's a species by caring for its greater possibility, enhancing its skill. Right? It's as if somebody imagine has become like a, you know, I want everything in the world to be contexted towards uh, to to uh, contexted to the greatness of the future. I feel this is an incredible way we can design the ethos of, uh, you know, of an advanced civilization. Why are we advancing to see how advanced we are? You know.
Yamato Suratomo says <coughs> Yamato Suratomo says it is not sufficient just to remain calm in the event of catastrophe or emergency when challenged by adversity change onwards with courage and jubilation this is rising to a higher level, it is like the saying, the more water there is, the higher the boat rises. Yamamoto Sunitomo says, <coughs> all the matters is having single-minded purpose, Ichinen. In, in, in the here and now, life is an ongoing succession of one will at a time, each and every one. A man who realizes this truth need not hurry to do or seek anything else anymore. Just live in the present with single-minded purpose. People forget this important truth and keep seeking other things to accomplish. Right, but that single-minded truth could in some sense be the trunk of a tree that branches out. There's many ways to mind. Yamato Sunatomo says if one does not get into his head from the very beginning that the world is full of unseemly situations, for the most part his demeanor will be poor and he will not be believed by others. Yeah, anybody who ignores the unknown is, is like, you know, walking in an artificial paradise of potential. <coughs> Yamato Sunatomo says... Yamato Sunatomo says when someone is giving you his opinion, you should receive it with deep gratitude, even though it is worthless. <laughs> if you don't, he will not tell you the things that he has seen and heard about you again. It is best to both give and receive opinions in a friendly way. <coughs> Yamato Sunatomo says the way of the warrior, Bushido, is, is to be found in dying. Again, an acknowledgement of mortality, strengthening our journey in, in this life, not reducing it. Yamato Sonotomo says imitating another style is simply a sham. Uh, and see, the thing about style, guys, is I think it's like the writer's voice. When a person writes for a long time, after some point they find their inner voice and it's pretty much if they were to speed up their thinking, how would their th th thinking actually happen? Right? It's, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think how, how else I can say this. Like, every person is a unique part of this world and if they honor that uniqueness their style is how they're being you know Yamato Sunatoma says Depending on one's point of view, Hagakure represents a mystical beauty intrinsic to the Japanese aesthetic experience <clears throat> and the stoic but profound appreciation of the meaning of life and death. Yamato Sonetoma says if one seeks to resolve a problem, let it sit for a while, take time to think about the four oaths, and subdue any self-centered thoughts, and then you will be able to proceed without father. Yamato Sonetoma says to think that being righteous is the best one can do, and to do one's most, to do one's utmost, to be righteous will and to do one's utmost to be righteous will, on the contrary, bring many mistakes. The way is in a higher place than righteousness. This is very difficult to discover, but it is the highest wisdom. When seen from the standpoint, when seen from the standpoint, things like righteousness are rather shallow. If one does not understand this on his own, it cannot be known.
Yamato Sunitomo says, I do not know how to defeat others. All I know is the path to defeat myself. Today one must be better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. The pursuit of perfection is a lifelong quest that has no end. <coughs> Yamamoto Sunetomo says, knowing the way is to know your own faults. Discovering your imperfections with endless introspection and to remedy them by spending your life training body and mind to show you. That is the way. Yamato Sonotomo says it is bad to carry even the good thing too far, even concerning things such as Buddhism, Buddhist sermons, and moral lessons talking too much will bring harm. says men of high and low status, clever men and artistic men, all V to exhibit their merit as loyal servants, but become limp and craven when it comes to actually sacrificing their lives when cal calamity strikes. This is an exclusive behavior indeed. <sighs> the question ultimately is this. Are the outer realms more important or the inner realms? And if the answer isn't beyond both, then any sort of suffering or karma can apply. Yamamoto Sonotomo says to summarize the essence of samurai First and foremost, the warrior must be devoted body and soul to his lord. In addition, he must internalize the virtues of wisdom, chi, compassion, jin, and courage. Yu. Foolishness. 
A mother loves her child above all things and will be partial to the child that is corrected by his father. If she becomes the child's ally, there will be discord between father and son. Because of the shallowness of her mind, the woman sees the child as her support in her old age. This book of Samurai covers everything. <coughs>
thanks for listening. Watch what's on the list.